So, as I alluded to yesterday, we're, we've seen two different, or we're going to be using two different approaches to solve equations in this module. The first we've already discussed at length, which is the chapter two approach, where we solve the exact equations that we wrote down approximately using numeric methods. And I want everybody to be very clear on the idea that what comes out of solve IVP or if you want to substitute ODE into here that's perfectly fine is not the solution to a differential equation but rather an approximation of that solution. I want to make this distinction very clear um, partly because I'm a stickler for words, but also partly because I think it makes an important distinction between these two different approaches. When we, I think colloquially, when we talk to one another and when you think about what Solve IVP does, it's really easy to fall into this idea of saying, when I write my function, the def, my system that returns the derivatives, I am quote unquote defining the differential. I'm telling Python what my differential equations are. Then I pass it to solve IVP, and what solve IVP does is it solves differential equations. Right? And colloquially, that's perfectly fine. But I want you to understand that what you get out of solve IVP is only an, a, an approximate solution to that differential equation. It does not have the properties that we would want from a solution to a differential equation because remember, a solution to a differential equation is a function. But what solve IVP gives us back is just a list of numbers. And I want you to be incredibly clear on the difference between those two things. They seem similar because the way that we usually display them is in the form of graphics. And so, it's difficult to tell the difference between this line and that line because they're just lines on a graph. But I think you agree that it is a lot easier to tell the difference between a table like this, make that Y, So let's say this is 1, this is 1.5, and so on. That's the kind of thing that I get out of solve IVP, right? That is what solve IVP is calculating. Please note, this is all solve IVP gives me. A table with numbers. Right? Not a function, not something that I can like manipulate, not something that I can say, well, give me that squared. Uh, I can square every number, yes, but I cannot get the analytic expression that corresponds to those numbers. When we talk about an exact solution, we talk about, and, and this is possible, as you have seen with SymPy, we can do analytic. So it's not about the computer being involved, right? It's the methods. It's not that we do analytic stuff on paper and we do computer stuff on the computer. The computer can do both kinds of stuff. The computer can solve these uh, equations approximately by using numeric methods that you are familiar with, solve IVP, and it can apply things like desolve, right, where maybe we get an equation out that looks like this. Uh, let's call that uh. okay, so that's an analytic version now, this is the kind of thing that I mean by that is an exact solution to uh, differential equations of this form. Uh, I suppose if I'm going to call this x, let's keep it really similar to the way that we want to do things. So that kind of differential equation, there's two different options, right? Like I can pass 
I can construct a function that returns this value and I can start at some initial value and then I can allow that to, to run its course and I can get this kind of answer. Actually, I suppose if you want to get it there, something like that. Um, and I can pass it to dsolve and I can get an exact solution. And so when I'm doing solve IVP, I start off with a description that is in the time domain that looks like a differential equation. What that has going for it is directness of the link between the equations that I write down and the way that I write it into the computer. Okay? What it does not have going for it is a couple of things. Numeric solutions do not always converge. It's not always easy to find the exact parameters that will result in a close match between the analytic solution and the numeric solution and so on. And so because of these difficulties, and because we cannot do analytic things like ask, what is the maximum value that that uh, variable will attain? I can't look at the table and tell you with absolute certainty that this curve will never go beyond three, for instance. But I can look at that analytic solution and tell you with absolute certainty that that is true. Right? So that absolute certainty is only available in the analytic world. Please note, not computer versus, uh, computer versus paper, analytic versus uh, or exact and analytic versus approximate. So all of these approximate solutions have problems. They are easy to get, but they are hard to analyze. That's basically the, the, the short. And so we're going to spend almost all of the rest of the subject in a completely different domain to the time domain. We're going to be working in the Laplace domain for almost all of the subject. Almost everything we do in this whole subject will not contain lots of T's, but rather contain lots of S's. And it doesn't feel that way, but towards the end of this module, you will be finding it incredibly difficult to write and think about these systems in the time domain because it is so much easier in the Laplace domain. Right, so I want to give you a little bit of an introduction. You've read through chapter 3.1 if you've been following along with the reading and you've refreshed your memory of the Laplace transform by having a look at uh, the appendix as well. You're going to read through all of that section again, but I, I, this part isn't there because in the textbook it's assumed that this is kind of an obvious next step, but I just want to motivate that even though we have good uh, numeric methods for solving differential equations, we will find it so valuable, the properties of transfer functions and the Laplace transform, so powerful in our analysis that we will choose not to use those numeric approximate methods, but rather to use those Laplace methods. Unfortunately, there's a slight snag. The most powerful methods in Laplace and differential equation analysis are all about linear differential equations. And we've spoken about this before last week, where I said there's this continuum of easy to hard when we talk about just normal equations, right? So it's the easiest to solve single linear equations. Then it is slightly harder to solve systems of linear equations, but they still have all these nice properties. I know that there is, like I know how to know whether there is a single solution. I know how to get that single solution if it, is, if it does exist and so on, right? The moment I go nonlinear, things get harder. Polynomials are kind of okay because at least we have the fundamental theorem of algebra that tells us that we know for like a quadratic that there's exactly two roots, for instance. Completely nonlinear transcendental, all bets are off. I don't know how many roots there are. I don't know how to know whether the roots even exist. I don't know how to find them. It's like a crazy thing. Okay, so for differential equations, that's multiplied or like it is uh, multiplied by a massive factor. Slight aside, notice how I sidestep the very common terminology of saying something is exponentially worse than another thing because that only has meaning when we have more than two things. Side note. Um, we'll be talking about that kind of behavior a lot in this subject. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be studying equations of this form. And if we encounter an equation that doesn't have this form, the first thing that we will do is to make it have this form. 
And we're going to do two very important steps, which we'll be discussing in more detail later. But for now, uh, I just want to mention that we're going to approximate nonlinearity by linear terms, and we're going to rewrite all the equations so that the Laplace transforms of derivatives become easier to do. The process that we're going to follow is to take a differential equation like this, to Laplace it, you know, and you thought that you were free from the Laplace transform forever, <laughs> right? Um, so we're going to manipulate all of our equations to have this very special form where there is no constant term, and we're going to uh, do the Laplace transform of the, of the left-hand side and the right-hand side. We're going to kind of, I've used some sleight of hand here, there, right? Or well, let's say plus C, I'll, I'll draw that out. Uh, and that's always going to result in equations of this form. So you can see here that um, I have now taken that uh, Laplace transform. Actually, let's make this nice and add an, an input. <coughs> but that's always going to be our process. We're going to take our differential equations, keeping in mind that we have an input. We're going to take the Laplace transform. Once we have taken the Laplace transform, if there's one thing that you remember from your differential equations course, it is that the Laplace transform is magic that takes differential equations and converts it to algebraic equations, right? Everybody remembers at least that. <laughs> okay, forget about the magic. I'll talk about the magic a little bit more later. But for now, I just want everybody to remember that when you did the Laplace transform of differential equations, the derivatives went away. And we're left with algebraic equations in terms of S. Right? This algebraic equation in terms of S can be solved algebraically for Y. Right? That's the beauty of the Laplace transform. We take a linear differential equation, we take the Laplace transform of that linear equation, and with very, very simple arithmetic, we now have the solution to that differential equation in the Laplace domain. How do I get back from the Laplace domain to the time domain? I do the inverse Laplace transform. Now the good news is, I will not in my life expect you to do a Laplace transform following from the definition. I will expect you to have a rudimentary understanding and probably have memorized the shape of the Laplace transform. We'll speak about why the Laplace transform does what it does later on. But I'd like you, to, I, I wanted to get this lecture in so that you could look at the notebooks for study theme three, where I show that SymPy calculates Laplace transforms for you. So you put in an equation, you'd say, SymPy dot Laplace transform, and the Laplace transform pops out. And then you say SymPy dot inverse Laplace transform, and the inverse Laplace transform uh, pops out. You can also use SymPy to do the solution. So in other words, you can also use SymPy to solve for y, as you already know how to do. Okay? So this tooling makes it incredibly attractive to use these algebraic methods to solve these differential equations. So we will, in general, not be using dsolve. We will rather be using the Laplace transform and the inverse Laplace transform to solve the differential equations that we're talking about. Okay? So I want to kind of just have whetted your appetite to understand the process that we're going to, to understand why we're doing what we're doing is because the analytic methods are so powerful, 
and to understand the difference, right? The difference between solving the exact equations approximately and having approximate equations and then solving them exactly. So, solve IVP takes the exact equations and solves them approximately. When we're working with Laplace transforms, we'll in general approximate the equations, the nonlinear equations that we start with, by linear equations. At that moment, we stop making error. Right? We, we, we restrict the error to that first approximation. And we can then do everything else 100% analytically exactly. 